the same will pass it back to the Minister. Thank you very much. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Helen Hayes. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I am grateful to have been granted this debate today. I have sought this debate on behalf of my late constituent, Tom Lazaridis, and his family, some of whom are present in the public gallery today. Tom Lazaridis was a 20-year-old student at Durham University when, on the 13th of June 2020, he dived into a swimming pool and suffered a catastrophic spinal cord injury, which left him paralysed. In preparation for this debate, I reread an interview that Tom's mother, Bridget, gave to a newspaper in October 2020. In the interview, Bridget speaks about her talented, sporty son, how loved he is by all who knew him, the overwhelming outpouring of support for Tom from across the country. Bridget's interview is also full of determination, Tom's determination and her own, and hope that despite the devastating nature of his injuries and the many challenges he faced, with the love and support of his family and friends and good treatment and care, somehow Tom would be OK. I am sorry to report to this House that Tom Lazaridis sadly passed away in November 2023. Tom and his family were devastated by his injury. Instead of helping them to come to terms with what had happened and enabling Tom to live as well as possible with his injury, the systems which should have been there to support Tom failed utterly to deliver the care he needed. Tom's spinal cord was permanently injured in two places. He was tetraplegic as a consequence and had many health complications. He had a potentially fatal condition called autodysreflexia, which causes unpredictable and dangerously high spikes in blood pressure. His skin was very fragile, leading to grade four bed sores. He had a tracheostomy, leading to communication difficulties. He was unable to cough, leading to repeated inhalation of food particles, causing pneumonia and pulmonary edema. And he suffered from muscular complications. Tom had spent 18 months in hospital, including a year of rehabilitation at Stoke Mandeville. His injuries were permanent and unequivocal. They were well understood by his doctors and they were fully and properly documented. The injuries gave rise to a need for ongoing clinical care from qualified nurses, which could not possibly have been delivered by local authority social care. Tom was discharged from Stoke Mandeville in the autumn of 2021. Under the policy of discharge to assess, he was referred for consideration for NHS continuing healthcare funding. Eligibility for continuing healthcare funding, according to the NHS, is determined on the basis of a person's needs rather than a particular diagnosis. There should be no limits on the setting where it can be provided or the type of support, and it is determined according to an assessment by the local NHS Integrated Care Board. The assessment comprises two parts. The NHS Continuing Care Checklist, which can be completed by a nurse, doctor, other healthcare professional or social worker, followed by a full assessment undertaken by a multidisciplinary team. Tom's assessment was completed in January 2022. His family raised concerns with me that the assessment process appeared to start with a blank sheet of paper, not taking into account anything that was already known about Tom's injuries and their impact on his health. For example, he was asked by an assessor whether he got around the house on a Zimmer frame and to show the assessor that he could not use his hands when he was clearly tetraplegic. His family were left with the constant impression that no one involved in the assessment or indeed in reviewing the decision later in the process had ever properly read Tom's medical records. A decision was reached in May 2022 that Tom was not eligible for continuing healthcare funding. For Tom and everyone who knew him, this decision seemed as astonishing as it was devastating. Tom's level of clinical need was crystal clear. As Tom's mother has said to me on a number of occasions, all that needed to happen was for Tom's very clear medical notes to be read. Tom's family appealed the decision. This process was beset by difficulties, including changes of personnel at the case manager level, 
records being lost and constant delays. Tom found the visits to his home intrusive and they had a detrimental impact on his already fragile mental health. There was no prescribed timescale for the assessments and appeals and no clear point of contact for Tom and his family to liaise with in relation to the process. Tom and his family felt that there was constant pressure for Tom to move to a care home, despite the study published by Professor Brett Smith 12 years ago, documenting the very poor outcomes for young adults with spinal cord injuries who live in care homes as a consequence of their own lack of agency in the decision to move to a care home, the shortage of properly skilled and qualified staff to meet the needs of residents with spinal cord injuries, the lack of independence and isolation. Tom was a bright young person with so much to contribute. What he wanted and needed was the care and support at home to be able to live well with the consequences of his spinal cord injury. In the last few months of his life, Tom repeatedly expressed a wish to end his life. He simply could not see a positive future when the struggle to access the care and support he needed was so difficult. Tom Lazaridi's family have asked me to raise a number of issues in this house which arise from Tom's experience and which indicate the ways in which the current healthcare system is simply not working for young adults with spinal cord injuries. The first is the discharge to assess policy. Discharge to assess is not designed for people with a catastrophic in injury. What may be appropriate for a frail elderly person who has had an emergency hospital admission giving rise to concerns about their care needs at home or someone with a progressive condition which may be reaching a point at which more care is needed is simply not appropriate for someone with a catastrophic and permanent injury. It gives rise to a lack of continuity from hospital to home and requires the person to be assessed by people who do not have the same detailed or specialist knowledge of their needs as the hospital clinicians who have been caring for them as an inpatient. The second concern is that there is no involvement of the patient in decisions about their care. Tom was clear and consistent that he did not want to live in a care home. He was a bright and articulate young man whose paralysis should not have resulted in the removal from him of all agency in his own life. Yet the completed decision support tool, the first stage in the assessment process, was submitted without being checked by Tom or his family. Panel meetings took place in a context of secrecy as to their membership, the dates and times of the meetings and the content of the discussions. A system is not delivering patient-centred care when the patients themselves are completely shut out of the decision-making process. The third concern is the lack of any certainty or transparency about the timelines for decision-making. The processes relating to Tom's care took quite literally years. The lack of continuing healthcare support had a profound impact on Tom's day-to-day -day life during that time, and Tom and his family simply had no idea when they would have any news about the next steps. Mr Deputy Speaker, everyone, the Lazaridis family included, is acutely aware of the pressures on our health and social care system and the need to ensure value for money for the public purse, as well as ensuring safe, appropriate, high-quality care for individuals who need it. Tom's case, however, is not a matter of resources. In the end, following the appeal, the ICB decided that Tom was eligible for continuing healthcare funding. The tragedy is that Tom's family were only informed of this after he had died. It is devastating for any young person to suffer a spinal cord injury which has life-changing consequences, but with the right care and support, it is possible to live a good life with independence and dignity. Depression is not inevitable, but poor mental health is sadly all too common. Tom Lazaridis and his family encountered a system which seemed incapable of delivering the safe, appropriate, high-quality care and support that he needed and was entitled to. As a consequence, they spent the two years of Tom's life, from his discharge from Stoke Mandeville Hospital in the autumn of 2021 to his untimely death in the autumn of 2023, constantly fighting a system which ultimately failed them. So I want to ask the Minister today what attention she is paying to the experiences of young adults with spinal cord injury and the quality of care that they, were, they are able to access. What action is she taking to ensure that the quality and availability of care for young adults with spinal cord, in, cord injury is consistent across the country? Will she look at the policy of discharge to assess and its appropriateness for patients with a sudden, permanent, life-changing injury? 
Will she look at the assessment process for continuing healthcare funding and take steps to ensure that a patient's existing healthcare records are always an integral part of it? And finally, will she take steps to ensure that the assessment process for continuing healthcare funding has increased transparency and accountability and greater certainty around the timescales and decision-making processes? No one reading the facts of Tom Lazaridi's injury and subsequent health needs could be in any doubt that he needed long-term nursing care to be safe and to live well with the consequences of his injury. Yet the tragedy of his injury was compounded by the failure of our healthcare system to deliver the care that Tom needed, or indeed to treat Tom and his family with respect and dignity. Tom's family have asked me to raise his case in order to press for accountability and for improvements for others. I look forward to the Minister's response. Minister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I also thank the Honourable Member for Dulwich and West Norwood for securing this debate and actually the very powerful speech that she has just made um, and telling us about the experience about Tom Lazaridis um, and his tragic accident and injury. Can I also welcome his family, I think, who she said are here in Parliament today um, and offer you my very sincere condolences for uh, the loss of Tom, who very sadly died uh, in November uh, last year. Um, and I listened very carefully to the Honourable Member's speech. I hadn't had sight of uh, her comments um, in advance uh, today. Um, and I will do my very best to respond, but I will assure her also that I will uh, very happily write to her uh, with further detail about the points that he, she has raised um, this afternoon. I'm responding specifically as Minister with oversight of continuing health care and discharge. I'll be able to say more on those points that she raised, um, though she also, particularly in her summing up, talked about more generally the care for people who have received, uh, have suffered from a spinal injury which is going to be very, very important, particularly um, when a spinal injury can have such a devastating impact and can mean that somebody needs a great deal of care from multidisciplinary teams from the National Health Service. Um, I could go into the, you know, the way NHS England commissioned services for spinal cord injuries as a national specification um, uh, and you know, a, a range of support there. Um, but actually, I think probably make better use of the time by picking up particularly on uh, the, the question of continuing health care um, and the discharge uh, situation which she outlined. I mean, I heard her describe, she said, how um, uh, Tom's family feel the system failed him. His clearly very complex health needs as a result of his injury, the long time he spent in hospital uh, and the long time in rehabilitation, but how he uh, he needed a significant ongoing clinical care. And she described how he was considered for continuing health care. I heard how she described the experience of the eligibility assessment and how he and his family felt it did not take into account his injuries or his health conditions um, and didn't take full account of his medical records and how uh, he and the family then were told uh, that he was not eligible and then uh, uh, subsequently and rightly uh, appealed. Um, and how I heard how difficult uh, she said that process uh, clearly was um, uh, for the for the family and for him, uh, including the lack of you know, transparency, the uncertainty, the feeling that m meetings happened uh, without them uh, and their involvement, um, and also how Tom felt under pressure to move into a care home when he really wanted to live well at home, which of course all of us can completely understand, um, which is what. Uh, anyone, whether, whether, whether um, a young person like Tom or, in fact, into old age wants to live uh, as independently as possible, um, whatever your health needs uh, at home. And I also heard about the experience with the discharge to assess as described. Um, so on, on, the continue, on NHS continuing health care and uh, accessing accessing that I and mean, clearly you know, there is a process in order to uh, access NHS continuing health care uh, the intention of the process is to consider the individual's uh, clinical needs and to consider the combination of those needs and how they come together um, uh, and to assess whether somebody 
is eligible and intended to design a package of care around the individual to support them where they wish to live, whether that's home or indeed in a care home. Um, there's firstly a checklist that then leads to somebody having an eligibility assessment. If I understood right, clearly um, Tom experienced and went through the uh, eligibility assessment, but as uh, the Honourable Lady mentioned, uh, the initial decision was that he was not um, eligible. Um, I say I, I am uh, very happy to uh, make some inquiries. As a minister, I cannot in, uh, uh, sort of make a call on any particular individual's um, decision that is made on them, but clearly uh, I want to always be uh, sure that the right process has been followed. Um, so uh, outside the chamber today, it's probably helpful if, um, uh, with the help of officials, I try and seek some further information from the Honourable Lady uh, and see what I can do to fully understand uh, what happened uh, with that um, and to be ensured whether there is anything we need to do to make the process work better, particularly in the circumstance that the Honourable Lady has described uh, with the situation where somebody uh, like Tom has clearly had uh, some very uh, severe injuries. Um, but yes, I'm very happy. I'm also very happy actually to meet with her and uh, Tom's family to understand uh, better as well. Um, on the uh, then on the, on the point that she raised about discharge to assess and um, that that uh, that not working for somebody with a catastrophic injury again and we should pick this up in a, a conversation outside the chamber. I mean, in general, the purpose of discharge to assess uh, is you know, a very good one to avoid people having long and unnecessary stays in hospital where, for instance, we know particularly for an elderly people are likely to decondition and live less independently as a result, which she is, uh, from the work she does in social care, knows very well. Uh, and that also, once somebody has been discharged home, often you will see, actually, that they are able to live with more independence and regain mobility in a way that wasn't clear when somebody is assessed in hospital. So sometimes the assessment in hospital will, A, lead to delays of the time, longer stay in hospital, and B, actually, to what's called overprescription and somebody ending up living longer in a care home when they might have continued at home. So in general, it is a good thing to do. Um, but as I said, I'm very happy to look into the specific question as whether there might be circumstances like when somebody's had a very serious injury, whether uh, the process should be working differently. So I will take that away. Also, the point about the involvement of patients in decisions about their care. I mean, that, that's absolutely fundamental. Uh, uh, patients should be involved in decisions about their care as uh, indeed should uh, families and, and carers, um, who will often, you know, in many circumstances, both patient and, their, and those around them will be really expert about actually what they will need and need to be involved in the, the ramifications of whatever decisions are made. So that should take place, but let's further, say, outside this chamber, investigate um, uh, whether that is working as it should be. Uh, together with the uh, points about transparency and trying to make sure that people are involved when uh, continuing health care is being assessed and uh, considers, um, considered. Because you know, my view is, and I know I receive a significant amount of correspondence about continuing health care, um, it is you know, a difficult job to make sure that the, the NHS has a challenging job to make sure that the decisions go uh, the right way and also the process I know can be long and uh, hard for those involved in, it, involved in it. And I want to make sure that it works as well um, as, it, as it possibly can and make sure that those who should be eligible clearly do receive it. Um, and though I understand in the case of Tom, after the appeal, um, the decision was made that he should be receiving it, but how sad that that came um, after, after his death and after all uh, the suffering that he and uh, those close to him must have uh, gone through. Uh, so, just to, con to conclude, um, uh, Mr. Deputy, Mr. Deputy, I thank the Honourable Lady for bringing uh, this um, uh, story and, and Tom's situation, his family situation, uh, to my attention through this afternoon's uh, debate. I very much commend her for the powerful speech and how uh, clearly she put the uh, concerns across earlier. Uh, and I look forward to um, speaking about this further outside the chamber. Thank you very much. And uh, can I pass on the deepest condolences as well to Tom's family, friends, and to all who mourn his passing? The deepest condolences of everybody here at the House of Commons. Very moving speech. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Has Mayor Lampin say aye? Aye. Don't you know? 
I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.